Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning to everybody who's on Zoom with us this morning. And good morning to folks who are on Facebook Live. Glad you're here on this fourth Sunday after Pentecost, uh, June 27th. Hopefully you all see the bulletin on the screen here. Otherwise, uh, hopefully it's in your, in your email. So as, as always, we begin with the prelude. And so I will mute myself and we'll hear that. Prelude, Be Thou My Vision by Noel Rothsorn. Welcome again, everybody. Um, a couple of you have made comments about the uh, photograph on the front page of the bulletin. That is the cross stained glass window that is found in our library at church. And I thought you might all enjoy um, seeing a bit of the church, even while we can't be worshiping in it. So uh, next week, I'll bring some more, more photographs. You might notice that the three baptismal shells on the bottom are the emblem of St. James. So uh, we would consider that a St. James cross um, in many ways. So welcome and we begin our service with an opening hymn called Be Thou My Vision. Opening hymn, introduction.
Blessed be the one holy and living God, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father, amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson is from the book of Genesis. God tested Abraham. Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram 
caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 113, found there on your screen, which we'll read together. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have perplexity in my mind and grief in my heart day after day? How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him and my foes rejoice that I have fallen. But I put my trust in your mercy. My heart is joyful because of your saving help. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt with me richly. I will praise the name of the Lord Most High. I, yes. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No, no longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient servants, you are servants of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become servants of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you were once presented, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for san sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of these things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. 
And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, good morning again. Oh, it's so fun to see all your faces as I'm talking now. Um, the story we've heard in Genesis this morning, it's sometimes called the sacrifice of Isaac or the binding, the binding of Isaac or sometimes even the testing of Abraham. But it has been a passage that over centuries has mystified folks about what could this what could this passage possibly mean for us? I want to um, I thought of as I was reading this, I thought of a test I had to take in fifth grade. And one morning, we all came into the classroom and sat down and our teacher, Mrs. Darnell, uh, handed out back in the days a mimeograph sheet <clears throat> that had like 25 questions on it. And they were questions like, who was the 16th president? Uh, what is two squared minus one squared? Um, all sorts of, you know, just sort of draw a cube here, all sorts of various questions. But at the very top, it said something to the effect of daily test. And then it said, read the directions before you begin the test. So the teacher said to us, now whoever finishes the test first is gonna get a prize. And I being the competitive person that I am, wanted to finish the test first and get whatever prize there was. So I immediately started answering the questions and I got down to the very end and I looked at all the questions. I'd answered them all. I knew I had the right answers. And I went up and turned my paper in and then did a whole lot of other kids. And it turned out I failed the test. Well, I got all the answers right, but I failed the test because the first direction in the test was read the directions before you begin the test. And the direction said, write your name on the top right-hand corner of this piece of paper and turn it in to your teacher. Do not answer the questions. And I, in my hurriedness and whatnot, did not read the directions. I had gone through and answered all the questions. I had not put my name in the top right-hand corner. And so I finished, I had all the right answers to all those questions, but I failed the test because I didn't read the beginning instructions. So it came to mind that we can be right about so many things. We can be uh, correct in what we're doing and yet totally miss the big picture. And I sort of think that's what happened to Abraham in this, in this reading. Not exactly, but near enough. If you recall, and I'm, and I'm going to do a quick synopsis of what Abraham has been up to. Um, Abraham was living up in uh, an area of what we now call Iran and Iraq, uh, Haran. And he was told by God to go down to the land that God would show him, which was uh, what we would have known now as Canaan. And that God said to him, I am going to make you a great nation. You are going to have more, uh, uh, you are going to have more children and more progeny than the, the grains of sand on the, on the beach or more than the stars in the sky. I want you to follow and go to the land that I will show you. So Abraham did. He picked up his wife and all his servants and the donkeys and the camels and whatnot and moved lock, stock and barrel 
to the land that God showed him. Now, once he got down there, um, it turned out that there came to be a famine in the land. And so uh, he and Sarai, his wife, went on to Egypt to live through the famine. And when they got to Egypt, it turned out that the Pharaoh took a liking to Sarah. And Abraham was concerned that if Pharaoh took Sarah, he would also kill Abraham because he would want Sarah for his wife. So Abraham passed off Sarah as his sister and then let him go and be taken by Pharaoh. So there's sort of the first place that Abraham shows us that he's not quite the good character that we might uh, think him to be. But at some point after the famine, Abraham and Sarah were able to come back to the land and uh, God promises them that they, again, are going to have progeny uh, that make them a great nation. But it turns out that uh, Sarah doesn't seem to be able to bear children. She's old as is Abraham at this time. And so Abraham and Sarah decide that even though God has promised them and made a covenant with them, a promise that they will have progeny and will be great nation, and have said that to Abraham and Sarah together, Abraham and Sarah decide that since Sarah is barren, this couldn't possibly happen. So they arrange for Hagar, uh, one of Sarah's servants, to basically go to bed with Abraham and bear his child. And Hagar does this. The boy that is born is named Ishmael. And it turns out that that is not what God meant. God meant what he said at that point, which was, no, between you and Sarah, I'm going to make a great nation, not between you and Hagar. So the idea here then is that even though Abraham is like 100 years old and Sarah is like 99 years old, I can't remember the dates exactly, um, they are told that they, those two are going to bear a child. So anyway, God reminds Abraham of, his co of the covenant that he's made, the promise he made. And eventually, uh, Sarah does get pregnant. She's absolutely stunned by this and begins to laugh and whatnot. And the child ends up, Isaac um, is named, he laughs or she laughs, um, which is what the word Isaac means. So um, things go along for a while, and then it turns out that you've heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, God has decided that Sodom is so wicked that he's going to destroy the town of Sodom. And Abraham goes to bat for the people of Sodom, and he starts bargaining with God. God, if you find 50 righteous people in Sodom, will you still destroy the town? And God says, well, no, for the sake of 50 people, I won't do that. And then Abraham says, well, how about if there are 40 righteous people? Will you destroy the town? And God says, well, no, not if there are 40 righteous people. And then it continues until Abraham says, well, what if there are just 10 righteous people? And God says, no, even if there are only 10 righteous people in the land, I will not destroy the town. So God changes God's mind about whether uh, he's going to destroy Sodom. It turns out later he does. But in this episode, uh, Abraham has uh, convinced God, has had this argument with God and convinced God not to destroy um, the city. And so Abraham here shows that he has a little chutzpah with God, that he's willing to uh, go one-on-one -on -one with God. Anyway, as we continue on, um, Isaac is born, as I said, and Sarah gets jealous 
of Ishmael, the son of Hagar, especially when she sees Ishmael and Isaac playing together. So she demands of Abraham that he banish Hagar and Ishmael. And so Abraham and Sarah banish Hagar into the wilderness with her son, Ishmael. And they give him um, some bread and some water and send them out into the desert. In the desert, uh, the water runs out, the bread runs out, and Hagar moves away from Ishmael. We heard this last week. Uh, she hides uh, Ishmael a ways off and then goes off away because she doesn't want to see her son die. And just at the point where uh, it seems like Ishmael is going to die, the Lord comes to Hagar and says, no, it will be all right. And I'm going to make a great nation out of him as well. And all of a sudden, Hagar looks around and there's a well of water. And so Hagar is able to give Ishmael some water. The child is saved. He ends up growing up and becomes uh, the father of a nation. Uh, traditionally, what we think of is that Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations. So then we're told after all these things, after all these things, God tests Abraham. God tests Abraham. And I, it makes maybe some sort of sense to do that. I'm, I'm not sure of God's reasoning totally, but Abraham has shown himself to be obedient to the commands of God. He left his home country and and traveled all this way to live in a new land. Um, but in other ways, he's, he's not so righteous. He offers his wife up as a sister so that uh, he can protect his own life and Pharaoh can have his wife um, to take to bed with him. Uh, he banishes Hagar and Ishmael. He's not always such a good character. So now we're told that God tests Abraham. And what happens then is what happens in our story. According to the story, God says, take your son. That says your only son. Well, it's not, it's not God's, it's not Abraham's only son. Ishmael is his son also, but your only son whom you love, but presumably Abraham loved Ishmael also. Oh, Isaac, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac, and go to Moriah and offer him up as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. Here is the test. Will Abraham follow God's commands at this point. Well, Abraham gets up, saddles the donkey, takes two of his servant men with him, and they go on up to the mountain of Moriah. And at the, it sounds like the base of the mountain, um, Abraham leaves the servants and they take the donkey and the wood, um, excuse me, they leave the donkey um, but they take the wood and Abraham has it tied to Isaac's back. He's got the fire in his hands and they go up this mountain <clears throat> and Abraham builds an altar. And Isaac, presumably clueless about what's going on, um, wondering where the lamb is going to come from. Isaac is obedient to God and to Abraham and lets himself be laid out on the altar that they have built and the wood uh, underneath him. And Abraham reaches out his hand. He's got the knife. He is ready to kill Isaac. He is ready to kill his son. And that's where he fails the test. At that moment, 
the angel of the Lord calls from heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham. And he once again says, here I am. He says, don't lay your hand on your son, your only son. And then right then Abraham sees in the thicket that there's a ram. And so he offered up the ram as a burnt offering. Now, Abraham fails the test. We can say anthropologically, he fails the test because, <clears throat> or he actually, he passes the test, but he doesn't pass the test. God passes the test because in that, in that time and culture, there was child sacrifice in the other societies that were around um, the ancient Mideast. There were, there were um, uh, different societies, families, clans, tribes, whatever that would, that would do so, or uh, child sacrifice. And so Abraham is in this first part of the story is behaving like all these other folks. Well, <clears throat> it's not that unusual to ask for your child to be sacrificed. God must be asking me to do that. So Abraham does what he thinks he's supposed to do. <clears throat> but it turns out he fails the test because the God of Israel is a different God than the ones that the people around them worship. The God of Abraham, Isaac, <clears throat> and Joseph, Jacob is not the God of Baal and Ishtar and all these other gods. This God cares about his people. This God is not interested in child sacrifice. So even though Abraham thinks he might be, he's not. And so God comes, the angel comes out of the heavens and says, no, Abraham, don't do that. Don't do that. And we're left with this idea, and you can find it semantically in the text, where Abraham perhaps is hearing, not really from the Lord, not really from the Lord that he and the people will come to worship, but that he is hearing from God, L, God, a God that in a sense is more primitive, that asks for child sacrifice. So Abraham fails the test because he's willing, he's willing to do this. And we know how traumatic this is for Isaac because never again in the scripture do Isaac and Abraham talk to each other. And Isaac becomes sort of a passive player in his own life. We never see Isaac really taking charge of his own life for the rest of for the rest of his story. It's only towards the end when he's asked to bless um, Jacob as his son that we hear him speak again. <clears throat> he seems very passive in that his mother, um, well, that he has his wife picked out for him. He's not able to do that. But the question is, or so anyway, so it turns out that this is a story about moving from child sacrifice to animal sacrifice, right? Here comes this ram as a burnt offering. And then even later in the scripture, the Lord says, I'm not happy with your sacrifices of animals and whatnot. What I really want is justice and kindness and mercy. That's the sacrifice of the heart that I want. So we're seeing this progression from child sacrifice to animal sacrifice to the sacrifices that come within in order to provide justice, kindness, mercy, um, help to the widows, help to the orphans, that sort of thing. <clears throat> but Abraham failed the test. So the question I think we need to ask ourselves is where are the places that we fail the test? Where are the places where we might mishear God? Where we might think that something um, 
that we think is godly is really not godly? Or where, where have we maybe sacrificed something that ought not to be sacrificed? What have we laid on an altar and been willing to do away with when it ought not to be killed? And I think if we look around our, our society today, look around the world today, there are places where we have laid on the altar the wrong things. We have laid on the altar the education of all our children and sacrificed the uh, willingness to spend dollars and times in educating all our children. We have laid on the altar as, our, as a country, black people, people of color, we have been willing to sacrifice them and sacrifice their livelihoods and their uh, potential, their dignity. And that even got enshrined in Christian thought. That was a thinking that some of us had, not that God wanted it that way. We put other things on the altar uh, that we think would be pleasing to God or um, are the right thing and, and we sometimes miss the boat. So what I think we need to do is always look twice not always accepting that what we think is what God desires is really what God desires. And we need to look at the whole of scripture to know what God desires. Sometimes we need to um, think if it makes sense that God would desire this. We need to have a discerning heart and a discerning eye. We need to be careful of who or what we are willing to sacrifice that aren't meant to be sacrifices. We need to make, be careful that we don't make the same mistake that Abraham made and that I made with that fifth grade quiz sheet. So what we do know from scripture and what we see exemplified in Jesus is that God desires that we love God only above all things and that we love our neighbor, all our neighbors as ourselves. And Jesus not only preached that, but he exemplified that not because God asked that he be sacrificed but because Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself out of love for others and be laid like the ram on the altar. Okay. So I would, Looks like we've lost Carol. I'm sure she's trying to get back in.
Uh, Jackie or Kathy, I wonder if either one of you would be willing to continue on with the service. Uh, Carol's completely lost her internet. Um, Kathy? Yeah, I'll do it if you'll put the bulletin back up. Yep, can you see it now? I can, I can see it now. Okay. Let us join together in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is, seen and unseen. <clears throat> we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He, he suffered, suffered death and, and was, was buried. buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. <clears throat> he ascended, he ascended into, heaven into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our, family. for our families, friends, and neighbors. And for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. for the peace and unity of the church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and for Bonnie, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in the church. for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. I'm going to unmute you all so that you might lift up your petitions and intercessions for yourself or others. Take care. For Isabel. For my Aunt Jerry. For Ariel. Don't Timothy. Yet. For Judy. For Margaret, for Pete, continue prayers for Jen, for Michael. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. 
I invite your thanksgivings at this time. Thank you from my dogs, from my friends, and my family. This congregation of St. James, for our ability to gather together using this technology. For those who work tirelessly to treat the sick during this pandemic. For my family. We will exalt you, O God, our King and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. And I invite your intercessions for those who have died. For Mickey, for Jerry, Pat, Bud, Jerry. Wade. For Viola, Jesse, and Mom. Lynn. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And we gather up all the prayers and intercessions that we have by saying together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, um, this is a first that has happened, correct? I dropped off the internet. Nod your heads up and down if that happened. Yes. So thank you to Kathy or whoever began to lead the creed. I appreciate that. One of the things I'm going to do in the next, uh, well, for the foreseeable future, as we think about um, the issue of racial injustice and racial reconciliation <clears throat> in our country is to begin to expose ourselves to more uh, voices of black persons and the talent of black persons in song. So as you consider what you offer to God, um, we appreciate that your pledges um, continue and that there are other contributions to the church. Um, as we have that offertory, we're going to hear uh, a song called Baba Yetu, which in Swahili is Our Father in Heaven. And this is sung by the Stellenbosch uh, University Choir, which is um, a choir that is at Stellenbosch University, um, just outside of Cape Town. So uh, here comes the song and I hope you enjoy it. I'm gonna step away a second because my dog has gotten in the trash and I need to go see what she's eating, but I'll be right back.
If you'd like to hear more of the Stellenbosch uh, choir, I encourage you to go on YouTube. They have some fabulous, fabulous music. And after you've listened to that song a couple of times, I dare you to not get it stuck in your head. Um, it's a beautiful rendering of the Lord's Prayer. Dear friends, life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Christ, and the Spirit be with you and those you love this day and always. Amen. Closing hymn, I'll play the uh, entire hymn through as an introduction. So sorry, I cued the wrong one. Let me restart this. No worries. Yeah. It's been a great day. <laughs> and it still is a great day. Our closing hymn today will be Peace Be With Us. And since it's not a very familiar tune to some of you, I'll play it all the way through as an introduction. And then I'll sing verse one um, so you hear the melody part, okay? And then after that, I'll announce each verse so you can keep track. Introduction.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Postlude, Fugue in E-flat major by Porpora. I'm going to uh, turn off the Facebook Live and encourage Facebook folks to come on over to the Zoom for coffee hour. And then in just a minute, I'll unmute you all. <laughs> 